What's up, everybody? Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of a Stoke podcast. I am Javon Stokes, writer, artist, host, everything, (laughs) Uh, and owner of Visually Stoke Media. Um, My normal co-host, Jamari, uh, he's not available tonight. He has some personal stuff that he needs to take care of. So my thoughts and prayers are with him. He's fine, but, you know, he's got some stuff to deal with. but this is our 50th episode. Um, I probably should have done more, but <laughs> I've been so busy this week with some other stuff. And just in general, over the last couple of weeks, just slipped through the cracks. But we are going to have a kind of a, uh, a, a, a more, hey, let's go Facebook user. I don't know who that is. Um, we're going to do something next week, um, hopefully some fun stuff, uh, you know, as a thank you for <clears throat> everyone who has followed us on this journey. Uh, I couldn't believe if you told me when I started that we would hit 50 episodes. I probably in my mind, I thought I would have got tired of this by now, but we've had so many great hosts. I mean, great guests um, and so much great conversation. I get excited for it still after 50 episodes. Um, As always, thank you, Savion. Thank you, Savion. Uh, And thanks for watching. Uh, Just be warned. Hold on. Someone said, just be warned. If Javon looked to the left, the interview going sideways. Uh, That's probably Kevin or Danny, and it only applies to you guys. As always, go to visuallystoked.com for all things Visually Stoked, including uh, heat number two, which has been sent to the printer. It is done. It is sent to the printer. Those who pre-ordered it, as soon as I get the copies, you will get your copies. If you pre-order it now, you will get copies as soon as as soon as I get them. Um, And I do appreciate everybody who supported, but as well. You can pick up heat number one, as well as strong number zero, and then uh, the heat collection, which has the first three issues of heat plus the graphic novel, 150 pages of content. It's a really great, uh, great read or great gift, whichever one it works for you. And as always, if you want to support the the movement, uh, if you want to support Visually Stoked as we do this thing here, Uh, Feel free to donate to my cash app that will go towards, you know, paying the restream bills, basically, you know, paying, you know, the normal things to keep us going. All right. Um, But yeah, I want to if I know we're going to get into all the the, the fun stuff next week, but I do want to take this moment to say thank you to everybody that's ever watched an episode who's ever commented who's ever given me a word of encouragement. I appreciate you um, and couldn't have gotten this far without you. Wouldn't have gotten this far without you because, you know, I would have felt like nobody's watching. So I do appreciate you guys. We appreciate you. I can speak for Jamari as well. And hopefully to 50 plus more episodes. Now, we actually have a guest today, a gentleman who I made the uh, made an acquaintance of on Facebook. But, you know, he's, he makes very interesting comments on Facebook and he's a talented I'm, I'm doing I'm supposed to be doing your 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 big intro. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do your big intro. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next guest is an award winning writer of several novels, graphic novels and comic book series. He's been writing professionally since 1986 and has had an amazingly successful and, and creative career. His most recent novel, The Brittle Writers. Just one best sci-fi novel of 2022 from the Critters Readers Poll. He likes to go by Bill McSci-Fi. Please give a stoke round of applause to Bill McCormick. Yay! <laughs> welcome, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. And you know, as a longtime fan of uh, visually stoked of, of your podcast, appreciate it. You know, it's, it's got like kind of cool. It's like. I get to, I'm sitting at the adult table tonight. You know what I mean? Hey, man, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I appreciate that because, you know, when we 
when we do creative stuff, we're in a silo, you know? I, 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 you don't I, I, know I, until, you know, someone tells you, hey, what you're doing is worth it. <laughs> yeah. I, I will clear up one thing. I started writing <clears> nonfiction <throat> in 1986. I worked for music magazines and sports magazines. And I had a web website called Jay the Joke, which was um, dedicated to sports and odd things in sports, weird things. Uh, we, we did some stuff, uh, co-sponsored stuff with Major League Baseball. And it was featured in a bunch of national magazines and everything. And then finally in 2016, I just, no one was helping me with it. <laughs> I was like, okay. I can't keep, I can't do this anymore. But right, we'll um, get there. We were, I was going to get, I was going to ask you all those questions, but you, you're, no, you're a pro at this, man. That's but, all right. <laughs> this is my first time ever taking to the people. Hello, people. Really? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you, mm-hmm. you, you chose our show to do this. Um, as always, we start the show with a very similar question. Um, where did your love of writing begin? When I was a kid, um, I was an only child, and um, I was being raised by my grandparents. And um, they, they, I don't know if they wanted me or not. It was just kind of they had me, and they were good Catholics, so they kept me. And um, But, you know, there was a span of years there. They were in their 50s, and they suddenly had this little kid. And, um, you know, they did the best they could. But a lot of times, I just kind of got left to my own devices. And... I was an avid reader. Um, My grandmother didn't know what age appropriate meant. So when she saw a collection of books for sale that somebody was dumping for like 10 bucks, she bought them all so I could read them at home. And it was like uh, uh, Aladdin, uh, the story, the original, the original story of Aladdin, the original Grimm's fairy tales, which aren't very grim. They're very dark. Um, They're not not at all like Disney or any of the stuff that's out today. Um, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Uh, Robin Hood, a lot of that kind of stuff. But I was reading that kind of stuff when I was like four or five. I didn't understand it all. Wow. But I, I got enough of it out that I understood the premises. And I started thinking about things and really fired my imagination. And as I got older, I started trying to write my own stories. And some of them were uh, god awful, but I was, you know, eight, nine, and whatever. And um, then by the time I got to high school, I was really start, I was taking classes and learning how to refine it. And I actually wrote a play. Uh, called from when the where the red light fades about a UFO visiting a family, and it went through some stages. And some, suddenly, a local uh, high school theater group picked it up and performed it. Wow! And, and it was like sitting in an audience, seeing your words come to life. I mean, I was 16 years old, seeing my words come to life, and seeing these people on stage getting it all right. And they got the little red light in the background flashing <laughs> and everything. And it, okay, it was a high school theater play. You know, they didn't actually land a freaking UFO on the stage, but it was wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I, it was such such a boost that hey, you know, the audience applauded when it was done. And I'm like, okay, um, you can do this. <laughs> I can do this. I, I got this. And uh, I started writing. I originally started writing nonfiction, as I mentioned, um, and uh, I did a lot of stuff for college papers and different things. And uh, I worked with several radio stations. And I got very heavily into the music scene. And I'd had a few articles published, but in 1986, I picked up a job with the Chicago Rocker. And suddenly I became, a, you know, every month I had a new article out and people started expecting me to be at their shows. It, it became a thing, you know. Um, uh, I was the first DJ to break Enough's Enough on a commercial radio station. Um, I was the first white DJ to break rap on a commercial radio station. There, wow. No one was touching that. In Chicago, 1988, no, man. I was going to ask, when was this? Okay. 1988, you know, and, and I was playing a lot of the un- underground house stuff, Tyree and all the old tracks record stuff. And uh, I was bust, you know, I had I was on at midnight. Nobody listened to me. I thought I was wrong. <laughs> it became one of the number one rated uh, off radio shows, uh, the C95. Uh, wow. It's called the Peter Chicago. And uh, they bumped, the, the, doing scheduling things, I ended up being part of the Shadow Stevens presentation. So Shadow Stevens, you know, I'm Shadow Stevens. Uh, right, he'd right. go on for an hour, and then I'd go on for an hour. And then in the morning, we'd reverse. I'd go on for an hour, and then he'd come on for an hour. We pre-recorded the stuff, obviously. We didn't stay there for 12 hours doing radio. and But it became a thing, and it became a real big thing. And you know, for five years, uh, I went everywhere. And then finally, ABC got bought by a – I forget who they got bought by, but I was like the last thing they wanted. I was kind of free form, and I, w- I didn't wear a tie, and I had wild hair, and um, – I was hanging around with all these kind of scary people who look more like you than me. And they didn't like that. They, they, they are who they are. Some company from Atlanta. I don't remember. I don't care. But so I, I got asked to hit the exit and I did. And um, 
picked up jobs writing for a bunch of other magazines, did the Jada Joke thing. And then I lost my job in uh, 2009. And um, I was kind of going nuts. And I was like, so I started writing fiction. I hadn't really written fiction before. You know, I dabbled with it, but I never did anything with it. And um, I, I, I sent a story out called Vorbless to a guy named uh, Don Webb, who's the head editor for uh, The Wildering Stories. And he sent me back a two-page rejection letter. And it wasn't like, I'm sorry, this doesn't fit our format. Have a lovely day. No, this was like, dear God, they would ride me out of the rails, ride me out of town on rails, tarred and feathered, and they would hang my family and, the, you know, in the weeds if I ever published this. Something, I guess, about having too many F-bombs and a sexualized nun was something to kind of put them, it turns out, a Christian-owned organization. I can see how that wouldn't fly. Yeah, yeah. But he finished it with this. He said, this is the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. You're an incredibly talented writer. If you have anything else that doesn't have F-bombs and sexualized nuns, please send it to me. And as it happened, I did. So I sent did, you not re- did you not research before you sent it? I, I, I read some of their stuff. It was pretty, some of their stuff's pretty wild. It just wasn't as wild as what I was doing. Okay. Um, you know, I thought I'm pushing the envelope. Well, I ripped it and then <laughs> set it on fire. But I, uh, so I, sent, I sent him another story called And the Beat Goes Foot, spelled P-H-U-T. Uh, it's about uh, the apocalypse happening in this DJ. Uh, it's in the future. And uh, I call it the techno apocalypse because these guys tur- learned how to turn off all AI on the planet. And so this this DJ who's an, you know, an iconoclast, he, he knows how to drive his own car, which almost nobody does. He knows how to do things on his own, which nobody does. So he's fine. He's driving around doing what he wants, and he's watching the world fall apart. He ends up sitting with this Arabic guy in a bar. And the, it turns out the Arabic guy is one of the three people who's actually started this and the whole thing and blah, blah, blah. And it's a good story. They were going to publish it on September 11th, 2011. That date sound familiar in America? <laughs> with an Arabic protagonist and a book about terror <laughs> terrorists? I can see how that wouldn't fly. Oh, I was so happy. I'm like, man, you guys got guts. You know, you're going to do this. It's going to be amazing. Turns out no one over there had quite put the two together until someone in the back raised their hand and went, yo, we can't do this. So they pushed it back to November. It became first story I ever had released. Um, it got really good reviews. I ended up publishing five more stories with Bewildering Stories before um, I ended up doing a lot of other stuff. And um, But they're, they're the people who kicked off my career, and I still I saved that rejection letter. Right? Anytime I'm feeling bad, I look at the two-page rejection letter. You imagine how much time out of this guy's day it took to just type like <laughs> No, I mean, it was it, was it was it like a critique or was it just? It was, it was, it was an explanation. It was a clear explanation of why he could not ever, in good faith, release my story. Why he could not ever put it out to the public. Uh, that it was just double spaced. <laughs> no, it was just too offensive. It was just. No, I mean, it was the paper double space? No, it? <laughs> no, no, no. It was, a, it was a, actually a big, long email, but when I printed it out, it took two pages to print it out. Oh, gosh. But oh, I man. saved that. I saved that. I've got it on my file. Uh, in my book uh, coming out later, hopefully hopefully this year, maybe 2024, uh, it's called Stuff About Things. It's a collection of short stories, nonfiction articles I've written, and a variety of different things. And that letter is in there to start the story, start the book. Like, this, this is the thing that started my career. And, I, I you know, you can't... Can't sniff at that. It's, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. You know, so that's hey. However you get here, I I, I get that. Um, wow, you you covered like five questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. I'm just listening. Um, what, so what were your favorite books growing up? Since you did have so many books, what were your favorites? Uh, Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, um, the, the Arabian Nights, all of the stuff from Arabian Nights. I really loved it. Uh, because there was so much, so much uh, depth to the stories. They weren't. It wasn't like you know. There were reasons for it. Why people were getting killed and what was going on and how, you know what open sesame actually meant. And it was like very deep, especially for a young reader. It's like you know you're used to very, very superficial books. That's what you get in school. And especially I went to Catholic school, so it was really superficial. We don't even get the Bible. We get you know we get Genesis. We get uh, Luke. Uh, sometimes Matthew. And then maybe one little bit about Moses. And that's it. That's the only Bible you need at a Catholic school. Um, so getting that stuff and learning to read that stuff and, you know, becoming enamored with it. 
uh, Canticles for Leibowitz, uh, uh, Miller's book. I fell in love with uh, the Foundation series. Uh, Octavia Butler, damn her, everything she put out. I just that woman, how she takes poetry and turns it into prose, and you know, makes a linear story out of poetry. So almost like Chaucer, but without all the baggage. Um, you know, I, I just a love Octavia Butler and uh, Anne McCaffrey, uh, the, the, the Dragon Riders of Pern, all that stuff. I fell in love with, and there's others, but I really like the stories that that took you out of yourself, that took you to someplace completely different. And, you know, and I, oddly enough, I'm a huge fan of the autobiography of Malcolm X. So there's there's something for, for everyone in my life. But there you go. I mean, it's it's always good to 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 have a varied, you know, taste, varied palate. So, you know, I get that. I get that. I, I mean, I love um, I'm a big uh, Stephen King fan. Mm-hmm. So anything Stephen King, I used to be really into uh, Gresham, but um I also don't get. I don't. I don't really get time to read books lately. Uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. I know. I need to. When I'm, you know, juggling everything, you know, it's really. It gets really hard. I, I prefer now like articles and short stories. Mm-hmm. Like I'll, I'll if if there's a, a short story up on a website or a magazine, I, I'll, I'll definitely read that. Um, what do you do? You have any favorite like writers? Uh, yeah, we could spend an hour on that. Um, I, give me your, give me, I, I'm not doing the top five right now, but give me like your top three. Uh, David Brin, uh, Octavia Butler, obviously. Uh, and um, who pick a third one? Miller, Miller, the Canicles for Labowitz and that, all, all that stuff. Uh, and one fun thing, several years back, uh, David Brin ran across an article I'd written about uh, fake science and UFOs and ancient aliens and all that crap. And I kind of eviscerated all the people who believed in that. Turns out he uh, agreed with me heartily, uh, shared them, shared my article with some people at NASA, and now he and I have been in touch. It's like ten years. You know, we're, we're not BFFs. I haven't been to his house or drank his booze, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, we hi Facebook user, um, but we have, you know, we we con- we we converse on a semi-regular basis. I mean, here's a guy who's won Hugo Awards and Nebula Awards and all these major awards, and it's like he takes time to speak to me, and it. To me, that's been my inspiration. There's never going to be a day where I walk into some place and go, "You know who I am?" Because now you don't. Um, just be, you know, be kind to people. And he's really mentored me in, in in some ways about that. So just be nice to people. You know, right? You, you don't have to tolerate everything everybody does. It, it's, it's not a circus, but just be kind to people. So see right. What happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll I'll say this like, uh, you know, I I. I, I when I was first doing my book, I got a little bit of notoriety, and uh, every now and again, you know, it, it's funny somebody else said the same thing. But they were like when you're sitting there in a, in a comic con or or something at your mm-hmm. table, and somebody comes up and they ask, "Did you do this?" and you're just like, "Okay, that that'll humble me real quick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that'll humble you real quick." Um, so. You you said you did nonfiction. You mm-hmm. you, you did uh, uh, articles for uh, musicians. Uh, what was your who was your what was your best what was your favorite article to write when it came to music? When so it like, came I'm to really, music? yeah, like who did you who did you like covering? Um, well, I was working for Chicago Rocker, so that was pretty much suburban rock bands. Uh, I think uh, probably my favorite article that I did from them was uh, on Paradox. They were a local band that. Uh, they sniffed national celebrity, but for some reason, they just never quite caught. And I never got it either, because compared to a lot of stuff I listened to, these guys had it. They had it all going on. So I don't know. There was some business thing or whatever behind the scenes. Uh, John Dobbs, the lead singer and guitar player, he and I are friends on Facebook to this day. Oh, cool. And um, he, they were a band I just I really admired and was really impressed with. Um, so I, I would say that was my favorite article for that. My my other favorite article, I did, uh, I did part of a piece uh, for the Sun-Times back in the whole... 87, 80, it's 88, because um, that I would just started playing some of the underground music coming out of rap. I, I would literally would drive to Cabrini Green and pick up cassette tapes, because he, <laughs> hi, my name's Bill. And can I speak to Dr. Death, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they liked me, you know, we'd go, I'd go in there and we'd hang out and, uh, you know, drink a few beers and just kill time and uh, they got to know me, so they got to trust me. And I, I was getting music, even like some artists were s- signed to a label. They wouldn't give the music to the label to go out until I played it. Oh wow! And so 
I got to talk about, you know, some of that with the article and talk about the, the upcoming, at that time, the Chicago rap scene was really just starting to coalesce and become, it, now it's, it, 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 it's your third coast. It's, it's a very major rap scene. I mean, everything from Common and on, on up has come out of here. And, um, but it came from those days of me driving around, you know, picking up cassette tapes and, and, and I mean, in Cabrini Green basements and in some places that, you know, Robert Taylor Holmes and stuff like that. Uh, I even shot a video for a rapper named, uh, uh, oh God, I forgot his name now. Um, uh, anyway, I shot one for Young Bino when he did the Nelly tour. And, uh, okay. But that, that was, sounds familiar. Yeah, we, just, we did that in East St. Louis um, where we actually had to get a girl to uh, basically be topless and collect all the guns from the gang members. We gave them cards. So at the end of the night, they can come back and collect their guns because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to start a war, but I also couldn't have 150 dudes with guns in a bar where we were giving away free vodka. That just that doesn't sound happening. like a good idea. Yeah, yeah that, that, not, that, that, that sounds like a pretty good, pretty good reason to not have guns around. Oh, and the other rapper's name was Grief. And we shot that down in uh, Englewood or in uh, Edgewood oh. Homes. And so we were actually, my car was uh, the, the prop that they used because it was a, a black Pontiac with tinted windows. So it looked like a ghetto car, but it wasn't, it was just me. And um, the cops actually showed up and arrested the artists and his background centers because they thought they were dealing drugs. And I'm like, so I'm like over there, I'm the only white guy on the whole set at that point. And I'm yelling at the cops. I'm like, you got to let these guys go. I got a camera crew showing up here with like $400,000 worth of gear. And the guy's like, how much? Where are you? <laughs> and then the truck pulls up and the other cars pull up and they're pulling out gear. And he's like, oh, <laughs> like this, we're, this isn't a bar mitzvah, son of a bitch. You know, we're, <laughs> we're shooting a video. Right, right. The end is, and we got stuff in movie soundtracks, you know, independent movie soundtracks and all stuff. But all these bands got something out of the deal, and it worked, and they moved their careers forward. And that, you know, all you can really do. Right, right. So you transfer. So once you hit about, what did you say? Uh, Two thousand and what, when did you move to to non to fiction? Two thousand eleven. The year two thousand eleven. Okay. Well, cool. two thousand ten, I started writing. In two thousand eleven, I started getting published. Right. So what was your now? What was your first like novel? Uh, that was you, you mentioned it, the brittle riders um it was brittle riders school. your first yeah the brittle riders oh, wow. what what won the award is actually the brittle riders book one second edition ah, uh, we've, okay. we've completely reformatted it and redone it um it's 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 a brand new book it's like i'm reading it like did i write this wow this is good um the uh the how do i put this i originally wrote it I'd written something like it in the 90s, and it was horrible. Um, but as I was writing short stories and, and people were print, publishing them, and I was getting some, you know, getting some traction, I decided to revisit. Now, I, it was originally it was just a cluster mess of a show story, so I narrowed it down to the five titular characters, the brittle writers, a couple of villains, and figured I'd get a nice novella, twenty thousand words out of it. When I got to a hundred thousand words, the characters were like, "Oh no, we've got more to talk about, Bill." I'm like, "You do." Okay, and then I was getting into arguments with my characters. Thing ended up being three hundred and ten thousand words long. Yeah. Um, now, now, give us the. Can you give us the the overview, like the for the people who haven't read the book? Sure. Can you tell us. Give us the the elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, a man who had a, a man held a party that ended up with the death of every man, woman, and child on the planet. Uh, his party was to showcase new creatures, chimeras, if you will, chimeras, uh, that were going to do menial labor and sex labor and be whatever people needed them to be. They rose up. They killed everybody. They took over. Now, that's normally your good science fiction story. This story starts after that. The Buddha Riders is what happens as these creatures try to develop their own societies, try to develop their own cultures, try to develop a sense of identity that doesn't include them being slaves anymore. And... Um, it's a difficult book to read um, because there's a lot of social commentary in there. It, it isn't just, we blow something up. Um, people who have read it really love it. Um, Garrett Dion, the producer who made a movie called Joker with uh, Joaquin Phoenix and that, uh, he, he basically, he's, he's, he gave us the blurb that we're using on the book now. It's like, this is, you know, it's uh, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy meets the Dirty Dozen. It's like, it's an amazing <laughs> That's book. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. 
There's two you didn't you never thought to go, should go together, and then you're like, oh, you know, that'd be good. I mean, yeah, actually, it fits. It fits. But uh, yeah, he gave us the blurbs, and we got some others. A lady named Xi Zhang from China said, "This is what happens when Frankenstein's monsters rule the earth," and I love that because English is like her third language. And I'm like, when she's learning English, she's like, "I'm going to read the Brittle Riders." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no." <laughs> that's actually the that's the pitch you should tell people. Yeah, I like that one. That like the Frankenstein that monster. Yeah, I, that's I, a good one. I used that for a while, and then people kept backtracking. It was like, so there's a Dr. Frankenstein in it? I'm like, oh, no, shut up. This thing is awesome. <laughs> okay, all right. So that so this is this is your first novel, in, in, or it, this is your second. This is the second. This is the, second. actually the third version of the first novel. Third version. Okay, all right. But so it's a completely adding, new edition. So you've been adding stuff to them? No, uh, we, we released it, then we re realized that there were some, you know, Independent indie years and their Thomas typos and stuff. So we fixed that and it came out again. So, ah, but it, okay, it yeah. was it wasn't like a renew book or anything. It was just you know some little touch, touches up, and we put a new cover on it because uh, Amazon kept putting me in the erotic ghetto or black women's history, neither of which I belonged in. But I had a picture of a female succubus on the cover. It was done by the I don't know if you know the art Jibba Malay Anderson. Um, he's pretty famous. He's from Liberia. He now teaches here in Chicago. Oh. Uh, He's, he's he's an incredible artist. I'm I'm honored to call him friend. I've known him now for more weeks than we want to talk about. But um, a lot of water under those bridges. But uh, he did the cover for me, and I thought it was a beautiful cover. And everyone thought it was a beautiful cover, except Amazon, which kept saying it's porn because it, she's in the in the book the character's naked except she wears a loincloth. So Jibba drew her that way, but he puts some, you know arms over breasts like they do for all the Dove soap commercials. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Well, the Amazon there was, and. Uh, so we went back it. and forth. We went back and forth for like a year, and then finally, this lady named Beery Stokes, she jumped up and said, "Man, I'll give you a new cover. I love this book. You can't keep having it ripped off the damn shelf." So she did. She gave us new covers. We uh, reskinned it and cleaned up some typos and set it out, and that did really well. That started that started getting me some real fans. And then the Brittle Writers Book Two came out, and the Brittle Writers Book Three came out. Um, then the uh, the companion series, Gopri of the Mist, just started coming out last year. Uh, oh, okay. one's, uh, one's out, two is in the middle of being edited, and three is somewhere on my computer, almost done. I'm pleased with it. Uh, then I, I wrote a book called Splice uh, for a company called Watchdog Entertainment. They hired me to turn one of their comic book series into a book. And that book won Best Science Fiction Book of the Year for 2020. Uh, my first time out of the gate, get, entering into a fan, having a fan enters me into a contest, boom, won. So I was pretty stoked about that. And um, it was a lot of fun, you know, and, and those those books are out. Like I said, stuff about things will be out uh, hopefully this year. And um, somewhere in there, I wrote a lot of comics, too. <laughs> okay. tell, tell us about those. Uh, the very first comic I did was called Legends Parallel. Uh, I was brought, I was, a crew of us were hired by this guy to create this universe, multi-faceted universe. And after a while, we realized that something wasn't right. Like we weren't getting paid. We, we were just kept getting a run around. So finally, I, I told them, I was like, I'm, I'm not turning in these scripts until I at least, I said, you've seen enough work. No, that I've done the work. So at least give me a deposit. And I sent him an invoice. You owe me this much money. And he sent me a, a PayPal thing for $10. And I'm like, what? So I just re rejected it. I'm like, you know, keep your, I need money, but I'm not, no. Not, I'm not selling my soul for ten dollars. Was that a deposit? <laughs> Was that yeah. a down payment? Yeah, you owe, you owe me fourteen grand. Here's ten bucks, kid. Um, no. So, so Brian Biggerlar and Daniels, he got the troop together and he came up with a thing that we threw out anything this guy had come up with, and he's like, all the stuff Bill came up with, that's what we're going to run with. And so we worked on it. Dorothy Jean, uh, she's the, an author from uh, Florida, Haitian author from Florida, and uh, she did. She acted as my editor and psychiatric counsel to keep me from losing my mind and uh a lady named sherry vanilla hardy worked with brian to create uh create the characters and get some live action people because she owns a modeling agency and she oh, got okay. live action models to model the characters because brian found an artist a guy named leslie taylor who's a genius and he's a wonderful artist but he's in hungary and he'd never seen a black person in his life other than on tv and that's not really a good way to get a reference not everybody looks like spike lee so, or Idris Elba, you know, like what he had. 
So, um, so we sent him over these pictures and um, he reached out to us and got some other angles on him. So he got everything right, started sending pictures back of what he thought the characters could look like. And he was dead on. He was like, this is what we wanted. This is exactly it. We wanted this whole 90s pulp magazine vibe, you know, just that whole feel that we wanted. He got it right off the bat. And uh, the book came out in uh, June of 2016. And uh, Brian reached out to me and he said, hey, man, there's no way we can straighten out these invoices because it just can't. He goes, but I've got an apartment that's free. And he goes, you can have it for free. He goes, just an move apartment? In. Did I an hear apartment. Wow. Yeah, an apartment. So I moved in his house and it, it worked out great. I ended up leaving this north side of Chicago, coming down to the south side, uh, living down here. Uh, Brian and I became very dear friends. In fact, he was the best man at my wedding this last year. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, my wife was really happy about that, too. We showed, we both showed up and said, I do. It was good. Well, I hope so. But, uh, yeah, so we started with Legends Parallel. We worked on some other stuff. Haditi Simbaba is now growing into a little, little – it, it's a nice forced comic. I think uh, another couple of years it'll be some, you know, something to kind of reckon with. But it's definitely growing, getting some titles. Uh, we signed a deal with a company called Nerdonatics in 2017 for distribution. Uh, and okay. that, that helped a lot. We discovered uh, Nerd and Natives, KJ Ivy, uh, who runs it, uh, he, he came up with this idea that any of the adult theme comics or more mature comics, he would place them in stores that were close to religious institutions or evangelical churches. Because all these frustrated people get out of church on Sunday and they're looking for some, Ooh. and so they were buying my stuff off the shelf, man. <laughs> restocking it all the time. It was like, God bless them. So, um, I'll take that evangelical coin, you know. You can't all go to one of those ministers. <laughs> so um, so we did that, and uh, I worked on a few other titles. I've recently been working on something called Marcy's Marbles, which uh, I absolutely adore. Uh, it's uh, by a lady named Elizabeth Gerald who came up with it. Um, it's an aimed after her daughter. Her daughter was bullied, uh, abused sexually and physically. Well, sexually is physically. Um, but Pretty they caught the yeah. guy. It was just someone in her family or someone in her family knew. Uh, they went to court, and this guy basically laughed at her. And I was like, yeah, so what? You're just a stupid chick. What do you care? He, they found him guilty, but she was traumatized and ended up killing herself. Oh, no. Nice. Uh, so her mom didn't want her, that to be her legacy. So she started. She asked me to come up with some way to do a positive image. She gave me Marcy's pictures of Marcy to draw from. And I wrote a story called Marcy's Marvels, and it was about uh, child trafficking in Chicago. But I, I wrote, aimed it right at teens. There's no nothing in there that's inappropriate for anyone who's like 14, 15, you're fine. And we found this guy, uh, Echo Pilantes, in the Philippines, and he did the art. And it was it's just, it's eye-popping. It's bright colors, very clear, you know, exactly what you want for a YA book like this. But it still carries the underlying themes. And so we're doing, uh, that did very well for her. We ended up, uh, both of us ended up getting interviewed by radio stations and stuff. And she sold enough of them. She's like, you know what? I made enough money doing this. Let's do another one. So the second wow. one is, uh, second one's being done as I speak. And um, like all indies, you can't crank them out one a month because there's no. one artist, one writer, you know, we, we do. Yep. <laughs> but um, it, it's something I'm very proud to be associated with. Uh, the publicist, Desiree Benson, does a, she does all the stuff for like urban urban music and urban authors. And she works with the Grammys on their urban division. And me, she's got me somehow. <laughs> we get along wonderfully. Hey, and, uh, it works, it works. It works, man, it works. And uh, so, you know, it, that's just something I, I feel kind of blessed to be involved with. And, uh, very and that's very awesome fun. though. That, that, that's awesome to have kind of uh, something, I hate, I'm, I'm gonna try and find the right way to say this. A terrible, uh, a terrible incident, kind of bearing this creative fruit that can, you know, exist as a larger legacy, you know, moving and, forward for 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 the individual um, for who who is no longer with us, but also for the family. Right, and it, it's it's a way to one of the big things like this new one that's coming out. It's strictly on bullying, and that's that's something I just hate. I was bullied in high school in college or high school and grammar school. And, you know, the nerd who reads too much and blah, blah, blah. Uh, then I, yeah. then so I started, I. then I started growing. And when I started hitting like six, four, six, five and being football player, 
stop the bullying kind of low, laid, laid back a little bit. Don't don't swing on the stop. big guy. Cause he's gonna swing back. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, but still I, that always has stuck with me. So whenever I see kids being bullied, whenever I see harassment like that, I'm I'm one of the first ones to be the stupid loudmouth going, hey, stop that. You know, knock it off. And I, I started mentoring kids at the Chicago Public Library down here. And uh, some of them have some horror stories, you know, what's going on in their lives. And I'm like, well, I can't fix everything, but I can be here. I can listen. I can talk to you. You know, I can find resources as needed. And um, that's what I did for several years. I really, I really liked that. Then the pandemic hit and you, nobody did anything anymore. Yeah, that it's it slowed everything down. It, it slowed everything down for me. Uh, d- definitely. I uh, actually. Well, yeah. I, I had to balance, you know, the work life with kids and everything like that. It was rough. It was a rough time. It was rough until it until it smoothed itself out. Um, so you you've done comics, you've mm-hmm. done graphic novels, and you've done regular novels. Mm-hmm. Which do you prefer? And <laughs> like, what are the pros and cons for you for both? Uh, you you also forgot I write movie scripts. Um. Okay. <laughs> Well, give me those two first, and then we'll die. We'll, we'll jump into movie scripts. Um, they're so different. Um, excuse me. Um, writing a novel for me is um, it's a very li- non-linear thing. I don't, I don't outline it. I tried outlining the brittle writers. <laughs> I made it through the second page of the outline, and I'd already veered off track because I'm like, it'd be much cooler to go do this. So I do get, it's kind of like ADHD. You look at the shiny plot line over there. Right. Um, my first drafts are a thing of nightmares because I do kind of wander around a lot. But when I start, when I go back and start putting it together, that's when I feel the shape of it come together. It's a, it's a very, it's a very organic thing with me. And I really love that. With a script, however, I do need to have a, a defined beginning, middle, and end because I got to get the character from here to okay. there. Yeah, and right. It, it, that's in a comic script or a movie script. You know, they're, they're different. The technical techniques are different, but the theme, the, the idea is, is, is right. the same. And so that's a more structured format for me. And sometimes I'm not Sometimes I'm not that comfortable with it. I have to like take a step back and go, no, man, you can't just go wandering around. You've got 24 pages or 28 pages, and that's right. all you've got, you know? And yeah. you, have to get, you have to get this person to there to there. So it's a much more disciplined form of writing. Um, although, you know, I mean, you look at the reviews, all the stuff I've written has gotten, and it's like, oh, hey, man. somebody likes it, you know? Hey, listen, that's all that matters, in my yeah. opinion. That's all that matters. Yeah, I understand, like, because in a book, you, there's no, like, there's no set amount of pages it needs to be. Like, the book is however you many page. Generally, most books, for most writers that I've talked to, their novel is however long they feel to get their story out yeah um, but you know in the book in a comic book like you said it's this amount of pages needs to fit in there and it, it i can see how like a lot of stuff that gets left on the cutting room floor so to speak oh yeah yeah and uh, I, i'm working on a comic now called pestilent and um it was, originally came up with by a guy named gary mack and he turned it over to me and we got the pencils done by Andre Lunatic, but when I was doing the book, I was working with their editor, and we went back and forth, and finally he goes, there's no way you're packing this into 32 pages, because that was that was the goal, to get 32. Right. And for those of you who don't know at home, comic, comic books have to be in increments of four, because one sheet of paper gives you four sheets of printed comic. So it's four, eight, twelve, so on. You, you can add it up. Right. So I got to 32, and he's like, there's no way you're bringing this sucker in at 32. He goes, it's just... You've created this insane universe. He goes, but that it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And we need to get it on paper. But how are we going to do that? So we ended up settling on 36 pages. Um, the, the reviewers one time sent me a note. He said, he goes, I'm a pretty normal, quiet guy. And now I'm trying to figure out which butt sex joke I have to cut and which one I think should be featured. And he's like, that's not comfortable in my home. <laughs> I'm like, welcome to my world. I'm, you're going to get There you go. There you go. Uh, but that's a great book. And I got another one uh, called Bob Sins of the Sun, which is also a teen book uh, <coughs> about uh, the son of death uh, wants to be a superhero in Chicago. And his sister thinks that's a bad idea. Um, that's that's really a fun, completely twisted book. Um, 
And uh, I actually pitched it to Neil Gaiman one time, and he's like, I'll see it when it comes out. I mean, he's like, there's no way it's going to work, so I'll see it when it comes out. It's like, but, uh, do now do, when you coming when you coming because it seems like you're very good with hooks, like you know, like you said, something just that quick, like the son of death wants to be a superhero. Like yeah. I, I'm sitting here going, all right, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I'd read that. I can see that. Um, where are you coming? Because you know, everybody has their own way of coming up with ideas, their dreams when they walk around stuff they see. Uh, where where is your inspiration coming from? Well, some of it's from dreams. Um, a lot of it is from things I see, things people I meet, things I see. It's very dangerous knowing me because you will probably end up in something I'm writing. Um, okay. Um, and I'm blessed in that regard because I've, I've lived a very diverse life. I've worked with musicians. I've worked with famous musicians. I've worked with not-so-famous musicians. I've worked with authors. Some I've become friends with some of the very famous authors. And I've become friends with some just some dudes you met on Facebook. And in the middle there... I'm one of those people, I'm not uncomfortable in a new situation. I'm not really good at like big crowds, but if you put me in a situation where there are all these people, are, these people are going to be different than me, I don't care. I will get to know them. I want to learn from them. I'm comfortable with that. Um, my next door neighbor is, <laughs> I've known him now for three years. I know his name. I know his wife's name. I know his children. They like me. They Every time they see me, they're like, hola, Bill, como esta? Bien, bien, yeah. And uh, every time I see him, he goes, yo, neighbor. I'm like, Mario, you know my name. He goes, yes, I do, neighbor. And he goes, about what he's doing. So there's that kind of disconnect with him that I've used, uh, that you'll find in um, in uh, Marcy's Marvels. I did it with one of the police officers in there. There's this kind of like social disconnect uh, with what's going on. Not not Nothing bad. Nothing makes the guy right. a bad dude. It just makes him a dude that just sees the world his own way. And, right. um, it's fun. It's, it's fun for me, you know, to... Uh, Takes, I, I don't do one for one. It isn't like this is. I, there's no. There, you're never going to see a character named Jabon in one of my stories. You know, not unless it's specifically needed to be there. But, but maybe out of our experience, I would say, you know, there's this really cool suave guy, and he's going to be doing this. You know, he's going to be down with his funky that stuff. Must be somebody else. That's yeah. what my wife would tell you. That must be somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> don't even ask my wife about me. We, we, we I want to stay married. <laughs> no, I mean that's cool. I mean, I, my wife is she's cameoed in one of my comics. Mm -hmm. um, my my stepdaughter is their names. Uh, uh, Trinity is I, I named the the city. You know, the metropolis, Trinity mm -hmm. City. Uh, Tiffany is a character. Um, I'm probably gonna throw Junior, my son, in there at some point. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but yeah, I get it. You know, you 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 kind of put people that you know in. Uh, or at least aspects of the people. Right, right. Because um, I know I've done that a couple of times. Like, there's a couple of characters that are just hodgepodges of, like, like, like one of my characters is is probably, is basically three of my best friends kind of smushed together to be one. Uh, I, think, so, I think one of my favorite characters is uh, Miss Ocean from uh, Legends Parallel. Because when I was first writing it, uh, the, the girl who, well, lady, who body modeled for it so we could send her image to Leslie to do the art, was a lady named uh, Feisty Nicole Brown. And when she saw the first, I sent her the first draft to see if she was comfortable with being portrayed this way. And she came back and was like, you know, I want to be sexier. I want to be, you know, she's like, I'm a model. Make, show me, model. So we redid the character as a, kind of like a Poison Ivy character where she only wears flowers in very strategic <laughs> places. <laughs> She loved that. And when it came out, she, she went and got a copy. You know, she was just in love with it. And then she started cosplaying as, as Ocean in, 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 at events where we, I, we weren't there. We, we didn't have comics or anything for herself. She would just show up like three quarters naked, <laughs> just like waving at the crowd. You and know, I, <laughs> she wouldn't be out of place <laughs> at Comic Cons. No. You know, if you look around, there's She's a in lot Memphis. of people. She's There's a lot of people that are uh, three quarters naked. I know. I've, I've done. I do a lot of. I did a lot of conventions. I'm. I'm going to start getting back into it, but I've just been really reluctant because I went. I saw, saw one convention online, and they were like, "We have great COVID nineteen safety protocols. There was no social distancing. Nobody was wearing a mask, and the indoors air was circulating. So that means you coughed. It went up. It came back down. It's like no, no, that's not it. Um, so I know. feel bad because. I so I'm at Comic Cons now. I my mask goes on and off. 
Yeah. Like if I'm if I'm at my table and you know the person's talking away from me, I can kind of step back and then take my mask off and talk. Right. But you know, when I'm walking around, I gotta I wear it. But sometimes I forget. Sometimes it's just tough, man. You just keep putting the thing on and off, man. Yeah, I know. I lost so many friends during the first wave of COVID. Um, Gary Saltzman, who used to be uh, Janet Jackson's manager, uh, he'd be taking over an Indian artist thing called Big Ma Big Management in New York. Big guy, large, larger than life, everything else. Two weeks after the shutdown happened in America, he was dead. Wow. And I'm like, what the hell happened there? You know, and and that started the streaming, especially musicians and writers and loner, people who are loners or used to just kind of being rebellious in their own way. Right. They, they were catching it and they were dying. And, I, you know, a friend of mine, she caught it. She's, you know, a mom of two and she caught it and uh, she lived. But the, the doctor gave her something she called a military grade expectorant. She was like, she said it was like hawking up phlegm covered rocks, you know. She still doesn't. Her lungs are still not right to this day. Wow. It's been three years, so I'm, I'm a little more careful. But I'm old. I have some health issues, and right. my wife. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm 61. My wife's going to be 60 in 22 years because I like them young, and uh, <laughs> not quite that long. But yeah, um, but uh, I'm not Louis DiCaprio or Leonardo DiCaprio. Don't worry, it's not weird, man. But uh, you know, I don't want to come home with something that's going to kill her, or vice versa. You know, we, we, we love each other. Like, hi, honey, here, die now is a bad way of bad relationship. But I am, yeah. starting, I am starting to get out and start to do some things. Uh, I think the next one I'm going to do is the uh, Motor City uh, Comic Con in uh, June up in Detroit. I was I was looking at possibly doing that one, but that's in June. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm probably, <clears throat> actually, June is super book for me. Um, oh, man, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Um, it's uh, it's actually it's fu not funny, but when I did, uh, I think it was Terrificon here in Connecticut. Before I left, my son got COVID, <clears throat> and I was masked up, and I was like spraying everything, and mm -hmm. you know, I started to take care of him so he would still be near me, but I would literally like mask up, change clothes, you know, when he's on me, everything. But my wife didn't. And she was just like, you know, it's her baby. She didn't want to go through all that. She didn't want to sit around in the house. Mm -hmm. And so when I was leaving, literally walking out the door, she, you know, I put my hand on her forehead. And I was like, wow, you, you're kind of warm. She's like, no, I feel fine. And I'm driving and I'm like halfway up to the casino where the con is. Mm -hmm. And she texts me and she's like, uh, yeah, I, I don't feel good. And then I think when I was up there, she told me she had COVID. So it it was kind of like a like you said a wake up call not a wake up call but like a all right you be careful while I'm up there so you know I had the mask on hands every two yeah. seconds and then Being happy birthday to Oprah you know <laughs> right and then ironically when I got back I think maybe three four days later I got it yeah, yeah. I, my I, son I, my son just wanted to be over all over me so yeah. I um, only hang up for so long. I I somehow missed COVID. Uh, I think I've gotten every shot they give you twice now. Um, but some right after I got the flu shot, the flu ripped through Chicago, and it was a different variant. Yeah. And I've had the flu before, you know, whatever. You, you're out for a week or five days or whatever. This thing laid me low for two weeks. And the doctor told me point blank, if you didn't have the shot, you'd be in the hospital on a respirator. I never felt so bad in my life. This was just a regular flu? The, the new flu that went around this winter, and it, it just tore me up. Yeah, we we got we got hit by it a little bit. Yeah, we were supposed to go to a party and called up. I was like, I can't go. You know, I, I'm I'm dangerous to be around. Right. And then this another thing we were supposed to do the day after the lady hosting that called and she goes, literally every single person on my list has the flu and three of them are in the hospital. So we'll do this later. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I uh, I had when I got COVID. I actually had a con to do like 10, 11, 12 days later. So I was like, everything was already paid for. And I'm just sitting here going, hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm, you know, negative by the time I got there. And I think it was like two days before I was negative. And I was just like, oh, thank goodness. But when I was there, 
I still kept my mask on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Still did that. But this last, I did Baltimore uh, at in October, November. Mm-hmm. And I was I was very lackadaisical with it. Like I said, I when I was walking around and I was talking to people, I kept my mask on. When I was at my table, I you know I kind of kept my distance. But it's it's tough because you know when you're doing cons, you want people to see your face, right? That, to that, connect that, with the book, and that, you know, I know it's it, you know we kind of make a line. A, a friend of mine, he's, his rule is if he's got if he's behind his table, that's like four foot separation. Right. That's, he's oh, he's like I'm in the safety zone there. I'll take my mask off because, like you said, I can step back. But you know, if they're hacking, I can step back. Right. Um, but otherwise, he goes once I get around the table, mask goes on. And oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, he and his husband both came down with COVID, and they're both clean, living, boring guys, and they both came down with it, and it was like, oh, he goes never again. Oh yeah, it was, it was, it it. So. It took my, my, unfortunately, my wife had it at the same time my son had it. And I was gone mm-hmm. for at the con. So she was kind of, they, but, but, you know, it knocks you out. So they were both sleeping a lot. Yeah. You know, but he was getting over it while she was still under it. Yeah. And then I got it, but he was over it and she was over it. And so I was like, well, she wasn't totally over it, but, right, but I still. was, yeah, but I was like, I, it, you know, it's a respiratory thing and I have asthma. So, and I have like sinus issues and I didn't realize, I know we're getting into COVID, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't realize how bad it hit sign. If you have sinus problems, mm-hmm. like I had no idea. So it was like, and it was, it jacked my entire sinus area up. And it, you know, it, I didn't even really have like breathing problems in my chest or anything, but it, you know, it, you know, I was tired all the time, but, uh, but so you, so you do do cons. Um, I do, I do. I I did a lot of them. Um, actually at one point I was making enough money to pay rent and do things just doing, um, I would bring a case of novels with me and sell them out, you know, and, um, you know, plus the comics and plus other stuff. And um, how much do you sell your books for? Fifteen dollars a piece. Fifteen dollars a piece. That's yeah. yeah that's a, it. It's a novel, man. You know, it's a. It, um, I've got one. Uh, hold on, I'm going to share this with you. Yeah, no worries. I will be right back. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> While he's gone, everyone. You can do both if you can do both. Visuallystoked.com. Pick oh. up all my stuff. I'd appreciate it. Uh, oh, by the way, to everybody who gave me advice on platforms to do digital drawing, thank mm-hmm. you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm trying face. I'm trying Photoshop right now. I'm seeing what I like, how I feel about Photoshop, and then if it doesn't work, I'll try something else. But right now, we're doing okay. All right, back to the show. Back to the okay. show. Uh, this is because this is funny. Um, in England, there's a company called Waterstones, okay. and they don't touch individual. They don't really do indie authors all that much. They'll sometimes make it available for print on demand. And that's it. Uh, <clears throat> After we had the three issues of the Brutal Writers out, Amazon refused to allow us to bunk them together uh, unless we did it for um, a ninety nine cents or something like that. I'm not selling a hundred thousand. Pa- you know, I'm not selling a thousand pages of books for a dollar. Yeah, you know, that's crazy. I don't care if it's Kindle or whatever. I, I'm not, no. So, what we did is we created an omnibus. And so, it's all three books of the Brittle Writers all packed together with new art and all sorts of cool stuff. And we put that up for sale on Kindle where we could sell it for, I think, 15 bucks or something like that. But, you know, the same adult, what you pay for a professional book. Right. And people, were, people bought it and it, it actually started doing really well for us. And I was like, cool, this was a great idea. Then Waterstone said, well, if that's going on in the States, we should have it on our shelves here in the, in the, in the Britons. Yes, we're going to have it in the Britons. So they ordered this. Let me see if I can can't see it. it. Oh, gotta flip it. Oh, it's like that way. Oh, oh wow. What is that? That's huge. <laughs> this, let's see that is a, excuse my language. That's a big-ass book. 
Yeah, it's it's a thousand pages long. Wow. You can buy it for forty five dollars online. Um, <laughs> Is it Amazon? Amazon, okay. Walmart, right. uh, Barnes and Noble. Wow. Uh, it's it's everywhere. But the thing that amazes me is people are buying this as a paperback. <laughs> awesome. Hey, you man, know? listen. You know, it. I never. It never ceases to amaze me. Even when I'm at cons, the amount of just authors that are there, mm -hmm. and you know, people just snap their stuff up. You know, uh, I, I was sitting next to a guy. I feel bad. I, I've seen him at like three or four different cons, but I, he had just diehard fans there. Like, what have you got? He would just, you know, he would just sell his book. He would literally leave with like nothing. I, I, that's where I was getting at cons. People were, I would, I would announce that I was going to be at such and such a con and people would go out of their way to be there, you know, and I was very pleased with that. That's awesome, man. I, I'll, I tell you, it's great. I'll tell you a funny story. One of the I'm very first sure. cons, very, one of the very first cons I did, uh, Brian and I did it together. And that's out in Kankakee, Illinois. And um, they had two floors and this library and everything. It was really cool. It, it, you know, all this kind of stuff you can do out there. So there's one lady. She kept circling by my desk. There's a black woman in her 20s, gorgeous. She kept, she'd come over, she'd see my nameplate, it says Bill McCormick on my nameplate because that's who I am. And she'd look at me and she'd look at the books and she'd look around and she'd leave. Five, 10 minutes later, she'd come back, look at the nameplate, look at me, look around, and she'd leave. Five, 10 minutes later, she'd come back, she'd look at me, look around, she'd Brian, hmm? closer, like Brian was closer to what she was looking for, but she left. Finally, she comes up. And she says, forgive me, but where's Bill McCormick? And I went, I'm Bill McCormick. She said, no, 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 you're not. Bill McCormick's a black lesbian. No. <laughs> so I ended up pulling out my wallet. Here's my ID. <laughs> you know, here's, my, here's some credit cards with my name on it. Um, she bought the Brittle Riders. But she... Um, she Why been, did she think you were a black lesbian? She'd been reading some of my other stuff. And it resonated so clearly with her that she only assumed that another black lesbian had written it because she was a black lesbian. And um, well, after she got over the shock that I'm not black and I'm not a lesbian, uh, she bought some of my stuff. And then the next year when we were doing the convention, she came back with her friends to introduce them to Bill McCormick and came by her table. <laughs> You're uh, just blowing people's minds left and right. Just you know, but I mean, but as a writer, I think that's the biggest compliment you can get that I resonated with someone so deeply and so personally. That they just thought I, they just assumed I had to be like them, and you know, I mean that's beautiful. I mean, yeah. oh, I, I'm flattered beyond flattered, you know. So. That's what you want. I mean, number, I mean, to that's what you want as a creative person is to resonate, right? Like that's mm -hmm. what we're doing this for. Like you, you either want to resonate with people so that they can relate to your work, or I mean, the other op the other is to kind of offend people. Um, and there's quite a few writers that love to do that. And yeah. Artists who like to do that. Yeah, I know. And I, I know some of them too, but I don't really, I, I want to tell my stories, you know, I, and yeah, I've got some stuff in there that might be considered offensive, but it fits with the characters and the character and the, the villain in the book, one of the Brittle writers, a guy named Jacques Nar, and he's nasty. And I can't just have him walk into the room and go, moo hoo, ha, 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 I'm nasty. That's not going to get the point across. So I show him doing some very bad things to people. And, um, you know, so when, uh, as the book goes on, you don't like him, you know, like, I don't think, he, I, I haven't gotten an email from anyone yet and go, God, when I grow up, I want to be just like him, you know. <laughs> um, that, that day may come, God knows. But uh, it, it's, you know, it's cool being able to resonate with people like that, to, uh, to actually get in their heads and, that, and stay there. Um, my, fi my favorite thing is uh, after the, the trilogy came out. This one guy bought it. He said, I've loved it. It's a wonderful thing. Goes, did you ever think of releasing it as three separate books? And I'm like, ah! <laughs> But it's interesting what you say about, you know, characters, because I know one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten is when you're creating a character, you have to make if there's to be something that you hate about them and something that you love about them, good, bad or other. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of try and use that, even the terrible bad guys, it has to be something that, you know, that you like about them because it's got to, you got to keep, got to keep them coming back, you know? Well, well, yeah. And with this character, the the thing people like when people start reading about it is that this guy lives in a very ordered world. 
you know? And so he wants things to be nice and linear. He, he, he doesn't want any of this abstract stuff. He wants a linear world. That resonates with a lot of people. They, they don't want chaos. They don't want that. They want something, you know, that they can say, this is my, this is my job. This is my thing, you know, so on and so on. And to get that even clearer home, there's a character in the book called Ulnach, and I had never saw a character like him in a, in a book before, so I, I really love doing this. But basically, he's just a regular guy who's, you know, tending his fields, doing his thing, loves his wife, has a couple of kids. But he talks, he does, uh, he talks throughout the book about what it's like to live under a dictatorship, what it's like to have to do all these things, what it's like to be have new laws imposed on you at random and at will. And he can't change anything. He's not a, he's not a character who's going to pick up a sword and do anything. He's just commenting on it. And more than one person, like more than a character to think about right now, have all commented that that's the character that drives it home that, yeah, my life, I live under a dictatorship, but I have a nice orderly life. This makes sense to me, you know? And that right. you don't think about that, but I, I visited uh, some people from North Korea one time and they like the order of it, you know? It's like, how could you live like, you know, you, everything's in poverty and everything's shrunk to the military and they're, but we want that, we, you know, we, it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what they want, you know. So, but it humanizes it, right? Yeah, like, yes, it, it does. shows a different perspective. So, I yeah, that's that. that's great. Well, don't say humanizes because there's no humans in the book; they're all dead. Well, but you are humanizing. <laughs> you, you are humanizing these these characters, yes, right? right? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> so, what I want for you to do mm -hmm. is who. Tell, tell me who your books are trying to reach. Like, what audience? Like, if this person likes this, this, and this, they'll like brittle writers. Um, there's there's obviously some elements of the Game of Thrones in it just because of the politics in it. Um, uh, I have more boobs and less dragons, but uh, you get along. Um, there, basically, if you like an adventure, science fiction adventure story, there is, that's the other thing, it's like, Although some of my characters look like they're out of fantasy, the succubus and the minotaur and what have you, they're there kind of as tropes. Um, the book, I actually spent a night with uh, what they call uh, hyper, uh, geneticists, um, uh, theoretical geneticists, people who are looking like 100, 200 years down the road. With mm -hmm. And um, I discovered, A, theoretical geneticists only drink the best booze and eat the best food. That dinner cost me a paycheck. Um, oh, wow. But I learned how to... I don't want to scare everybody in the audience, but I learned there is a way that you could would take a human being and recreate them to be a succubus or to be a minotaur. And it's not as hard as you would think. Well, it's beyond our capabilities now, but the basic theories behind it are pretty straightforward. Um, you just need to add a couple of genes to the DNA and uh, start wrapping it up and playing with stuff. Uh, and as they explained to me, if, let's, let's say there's a wolf in the character, so he's full body here, right? Well, that's a, the gene people have. It's a repressed in human, but it's in there. You just turn it on. So you don't need anything new there. You just turn that on. Um, you want to do a half badger, half human? Okay, that you've got the genes in there because we all have these same mammalian genes. Just pick and choose the ones you want. Make sure the talents and all that work. And dial it up and throw it in the blender. And you got that. And so on down the line. And we discovered for wings, you need extra DNA. So that you can uh, hollow out the bone, or you make the bones lighter, and add wings to give them flight. And it was kind of a scary thought because I mean I was writing the Brittle Riders, and that's like you know a thousand years in the future, and these people are like, oh yeah, we could, uh, we're probably like a hundred years away from building that. That's terrifying. <laughs> really? It's not surprising, I, but it's definitely terrifying. I signed a nine-page non-disclosure agreement that I think will apply to my great-grandchildren. But I got all the information I needed to make that book. And that makes the book more real, too, because there's real science in there. There's real bats. And... So so what what draws you to sci-fi as opposed to other genres? I get to tell my story without dipping into the real world. Um, I, I, there are very pronounced social things I want to say. There's very pronounced political things I want to say. But I found if I, if I put it in part of a story that's more fantastical, it's not like slapping somebody upside the face going, do that, you know. Um, I want them to understand why I think the way I do. And 
to do that in um if i were to do it like in a straight thriller splice is pretty much a straight thriller but even in that i um dialed some stuff off what i would normally do for sci-fi uh for example in splice there's no sex at all um it's just it's action from from the very op the opening line of the book is hippity hoppity until you drop it and the very last line of the book is well you'll have to read it and find out but it there like every single part of a chapter has a, a hit line in it and so right. i made that i made that my um my go through there because I had a real tough story to tell. I, I, Splice is basically the story of a 10 year old black kid who gets abandoned in Omaha and grows up to become the world's greatest supervillain. And how do you do that without making him a cliche or being insulting or, you know, pulling out some sort of racist crap? And so I was careful about that. But as, I, as the character started to develop, it, um, it, uh, it, it really came, it really came to life. And, it's a roller coaster ride. I don't. I normally write to make you think. I, I take you back. I, I let you sit back a little bit. With splice, I just started hitting you in the face, and I kept hitting you until you closed the book. Um, so that was fun to write. And uh, I'm working on another one right now called uh, "It Came from the Darkling Skies," and um, that's another one where I'm just I'm just going to pick up a fish off the counter and start slapping you outside the head with it. Uh, There's going to be a standalone book, and I'm I'm about a third of the way through it where i really like everything and i got my notes now where i'm going to go with it so i'll get that one done this year and send it out so what happens so it sounds like most of your books have like a diverse cast oh yeah um, and 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 if i and i'll be honest uh it seems like most white writers don't really want to do that like or don't seem to do it or can't do it well um, where do you get your inspiration to do it, to be, have a diverse cast? Like, is it something that, you know, you are trying to fill the niche of oh, no, there's no, just no, not no. enough, or is it, do you just trying to like, tell me where, where your inspiration lies? All right. Well, I, this, this one's kind of easy. I am the only white guy in my building. My, my best man was black. He's my, one of my best friends on the planet. Um, my neighbors across the hall, we fell in love with each other the day we met. And, you know, their daughter comes to me every now and then for advice when we talk. Um, I, I want diverse cast because I have friends. I have Muslim friends. I have Buddhist friends. I have, uh, and those are all represented in the Brittle Riders. Uh, chapter two or book two has a character named Ben Al Salam, um, which is kind of a, a funny character. But I wrote it and then I didn't, I wrote it and then I sent it to an imam I know. And I said, Am I flying right with this one? Because I don't want to offend anyone, but I do want to have, I do use humor in my book, you know? And he wrote me back. He goes, well, I've stopped laughing now. So yeah, go with it. It's great. It's a great character. And it's a very sympathetic character. And um, it allows me to use tracks of the Holy Quran is to get his points across and why he was still believed in God when obviously the world had changed. Right. Um, um, but I, so I wanted to represent my friends. I wanted to represent the people I know, people I care about. And, um, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not like I'm writing LGBTQ characters or black characters or brown characters or anything else. I'm writing my friends and then just kind of coloring in the, between the lines. And um, so these people are very real to me. You know, I mean, well, they're, they're real. They're real people. Right. Uh, it's my, I've been kind of blessed. I mean, I worked with James Brown in the 90s. And so I've worked with African-American artists like, you know, since the 80s. And. You know, that, that for me, as I was coming up, I was young, I played bands, I did what I did. But I, like I said before, I was never afraid to walk into a space and not be the only one there. I'm going to learn. I'm going to, I, I'm there to learn. I'm not there to take over. I'm there to learn. And that's gotten me through a lot. And it's given me a chance to develop friendships that might not have otherwise had. Um, it's given me a chance to have people in my life that not only enrich my life, but allow me to enrich my characters when I write them because they're not they're not stereotype characters. It isn't like Heinlein, like I wrote a black person and she sounds just like me. Well, Bob, I gotta tell you, not a lot of black women walked around like they were Marines in 1939. There's just, that vibe isn't there, you know? Um, now, do you reach out, do you run it by, like <clears throat> if you have a black character, do you run it by somebody of color and say, hey, does this sound authentic? Oh yeah, absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I, it, it isn't like I'm looking for approval, but I am looking for, uh, 
I call it idiot control. You know, I, I, I try not to be prejudiced. I try not to be racist. But I grew up in an Irish Catholic family where it was like, this is our Italian neighbor. This is our, everybody got a, everybody got a race name and a, and a tag. And, gotcha. you know, so that's how I grew up. And I didn't like that. And, um, you know, I, I tried to expand out. And, but as I got to know people, I was like, I try and include that in my books. And then, like you say, if I'm writing something, I'm not so uncomfortable now writing a black character because I'm so, so, I know so many black people. They know me right back, so that worked out great. Um, but like when I was writing the Muslim character, yes, I did run it by an imam because I, I do not want to offend an entire, you know, the world's largest religion doesn't need to be pissed off by me. No, um, it's not, that doesn't sound like a good idea. No, so I, I wanted to write something that was respectful, but still keeping with the tone of the book, fun and interesting. Um, and he's a great character. And um, over on Goodreads, where I get more of my reviews, several people brought up that's like, I've never met a Muslim before. And they go, now I want to meet more. And I'm like, good, that's you. I've succeeded. My job is my job here is done. Um, I mean, you know, I, I appreciate that because, you know, one of the things that a, a lot of people um, talk about is, when you're looking for authenticity, you need to go to the source, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had a gentleman on the show. Oh, man. Is it Greg? It might have been Greg, I would say. Um, just talking about the L No, it was uh, whatever. Uh, talking about LBGTQ uh, community and how, like, you know, they want more writers to run it by. Just run it by somebody so that, you know, it, it A, doesn't offend them, and B sounds real as opposed to just being stereotypical. Um, oh, yeah. So to hear that, you know, you actually make the effort, you know, that goes a long way, you know, especially for, you know, uh, for anybody who's reading your work, because then it becomes a matter of, okay, well, this feels real as opposed to this is what you think a Muslim is like, you right? Because that's a, a lot of writers do that, unfortunately. Like, this is what I think a Muslim is like. This is what I think a, you know, an Asian person is like. And and instead of taking the time to go, let me learn about your culture. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to somebody who's in the culture. So I I, I do appreciate that. When um, actually uh, because of that part of me, the way I work things, I was working with some kids, uh, transgender kids and LGBTQ kids at the library. I was working on some stuff. And one of them mentioned the fact that there's no legitimate trans characters. Like even in DC and Marvel, the couple that are there, they're, they're off to the side. They're, they're not leading the charge. And um, so uh, we sat down and I wrote a book, I wrote something uh, called Savarchik. And because I was going through some deals with the Russian government at that time with Brittle Riders that got bootlegged over there. And they basically told me, well, you know, for allowing my book to be bootlegged, I'd be arrested if I ever set foot on Russian soil. I'm like, um, um, yeah, never mind. So I was very angry at Russia at that time. And um, the, these these ladies were talking to me and we started talking and we went back and forth about what a transgendered superhero would be like. And they're like, well, the superhero should be transitioned as the power should transition as well as the person doing it. So we wrote this. And so it's a, basically it's a, a woman trapped inside a man and a God trapped inside a hero. And they all become one person. It's called Savarcha. So this is a woman who's now she's a woman. She starts out as a boy, but she ends up as a woman. And suddenly a Serbian fire god awakens inside of her, thinking he's awakened in his like 17th generation grandson. And he's like, oh, blah, blah, huh? <laughs> and it's funny, but it's a cool story. Uh, okay. People really like it. I'm giving it away for free right now because I'm going to circle back. When I get some extra money, I'm going to have the art, go back to the artist and redo like a whole big thing with it. But, um, it was, that came from me sitting around with transgender kids asking, what would you like? And reading, going through the script with them. And I remember one of them looking at me and said, that, wow, she's like, I think this is great, but how did the words get out of your head and onto the paper? And I'm like, I use a typewriter. <laughs> but we, we had a lot of fun doing it. And it came out and I made, I, I ordered extra copies. So I gave them all copies. And, um, all right. and to this day, they still have it. So yeah, if you talk with people and sit and listen to people you can learn a lot you can accomplish a lot and occasionally get a weird cool comic book out of it yeah, that's a lesson most people should learn um so we're gonna we're running down as we go uh unfortunately i have not eaten dinner 
Ah. So my, if you haven't heard my stomach, it's surprising. Cause I'm <laughs> um, what we do at the end of every show is we do actually, there's one thing I want to do. There's a young gentleman who's a writer out right. Um, uh, uh, Savion. Um, I'm going to ask one question for him and then we'll do a top five. Um, if you have any advice to somebody who, who wants to be a writer, mm -hmm. uh, what would those, what would that be? Throw so, words at paper. Don't care. <clears throat> I don't care if they make any sense. I don't care if it's a cottage cheese and garbage. Write. Write it. Get it all out of your head. You can always come back and edit. That's what editing is for. Trust me. Trust me. That's what editing is for. Um, there are tools that can help you like Grammarly and other things. But ignore all of that when you start. You've got a story in your head. You've got something you want to say. Write it. If you ever run across a writer's block, the best advice I ever got was from another writer who makes a lot of money writing books. He said, Whenever he gets stuck, he writes grocery lists or something. Just get the get the brain going on words. Start thinking words again. And then you come back to your story and you'll be surprised. You can start writing it again. It'll start working for you. Uh, but the best advice I can give you is just write. Keep writing. Don't stop writing. And uh, and don't stop writing some more. You know, just stay at it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is what we're going to do. This is one I'm going to have you do because I don't oh. know if I can actually do this one. I might try, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one to you. Top five favorite main characters in books. Top five main characters in books. Um, I'm gonna try. Ooh, uh, you're welcome, Savi. I think it just popped up there. Um, and I'm drawing a blank on everything. Uh, Labelwitz Mechanicals, of course. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I'm foundation and I'm, I'm skipping on the, I can't remember the guy's name. Real bad. Um, Don't worry about the name. Just, you, you, I mean, I know it's hard to come up with a name. I'm trying to think of the name of a character. John a Smith from, uh, uh, Heinlein's, uh, uh, um, Stranger in a Strange Land. Okay. Um, that's two. Uh, no, that's three. I got, uh, Le uh, uh Leviticus. Or okay. uh, uh, kind of well, Labowitz, excuse me, Labowitz. We got Foundation. We got uh, John Smith. Uh, okay. Um, Zinn from uh, uh, the Voyage of the Space Beagle uh, is a great one. Um, and I would have to say, kind of my last one is going to be uh, uh, guy, guy, guy's guy, name. Anyways, from David Brin's. Uh, 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 the wars. Uh, what are they called? Um, uh, the the uplift wars. Uh, okay. He's got a, a, a chimpanzee's character whose name I keep forgetting, but it's a character that loves to drink beer, has sex with multiple women, and carries a rifle with him when he goes out in public. It's just you can't you got to love that in a guy. You know? <laughs> Wait, he's not a monkey though, right? He just he's a he's a real guy. No, he's a monkey. He's a monkey that has. He's a monkey that they women. they lifted his brain up, so now he has like a human brain and a monkey body. Ah. That's uplift. Um, actually, that was kind of my inspiration for the Bill Riders, except that instead of uplifting being a good thing where everybody gets along and it's a wonderful thing, my people get uplifted, they kill everybody. Because I just I haven't seen the human race do well. You know. Well, you know, we rarely do well in yeah. sci-fi in general, like yeah. outside of what the Jetsons and Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> We really don't do well. No. Yeah, I can't do this one. This might you. I have stumped myself, because in my mind I'm thinking the uh, what's the guy from the stand? Um, the main guy. God, I have Harry, I know. Uh, he. Oh, I cannot remember his name. Anyway, uh, that guy. I I can't. Wow, I stumped myself. That is a first. I'm, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better on that one. I'm going to come back in a year and do that one. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Uh, so you want to tell people where they can get your stuff? Yeah, it's actually pretty easy. Um, go to BillMcSciFi.com, and I have links to everything everywhere. Um, there's even a little bit more bio about me. Um, you can get hold of all my short stories. And if you go to my blogs, I have a page set up with – it's literally called Free Shit. You can get – interviews you can get short stories that have gone into you know gone reverted back to me and there i just put them up online um 
And that's how that lady uh, found me. She was reading all that stuff. And I don't know. I mean, my picture's online. I do not look like a black lesbian, but there we go. Um, so, yeah, BillMcSciFi.com. Go there. Hap around. Uh, you can sign up for my mailing list. You're welcome to join. Um, it's usually weekly, but I've been tapering off on it lately because I got someone behind the scenes. I don't want to screw something up and jinx it. But uh, so we're just, you know, doing yeah, what no, we you can. told me. I'm looking for, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for the best. Uh, oh, man, when that, yeah, no one knows what Javon and I are talking about, but basically I had a meeting today that I've been doing these meetings for a while, you know, as people get different interests in talking to different people. But when this guy stopped it and said, all right, when we pitch this for financing, I went, okay, I heard a we and <laughs> financing in the same sentence, and nobody had a laugh track, you know? Yeah, no one laughed. So, uh, yeah, so we, we stepped up our game today. And, uh, but yeah, go to BillMcSciFi.com. Have yourself a merry old time. There's lots of stuff up there. There's even some free comics you can read, including the Savar chick that I just talked about. Um, so do that. Go get to, get to know me. All I don't right. bite. Well, thank you so much for coming on for our 50th episode. I want to thank everybody for stopping by for our 50th episode. Uh, like I said, next week we'll celebrate a little more. Uh, and when I take some time to do some stuff, because uh, you know, y'all know I'm, I'm busy all the time. Uh, Bill, thank you for joining. Uh, oh, I'm my looking pleasure. forward to seeing. I'm, I'm going to check out this BillMcSciFi.com. Hopefully I get to see you at a con at some point. I hope uh, so, too. Yeah, we got to get close. When you're in Chicago, though, that's tough. That's yeah. Yeah, got to come over I, to the Northeast. That's why I, I I almost did a series of cons in Texas, but the financing blew out on it. Oh, but uh, I, I, that's going the opposite way. <laughs> no, but I'm I'm willing to travel. I just you know I, I kind of need to make it worth my while. Right, just, right. No, I get trust me. I understand about the math and needing the math. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, thank you for stopping by. I I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I, I, I've been looking forward to this because uh, I love talking with people who do something a little different than comic books. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. Um, have a great weekend. Have a great... It's a holiday weekend, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a holiday weekend. So uh, enjoy your holiday weekend. Like like Bill said, go to BillMcSciFi.com and check out his stuff. Um, as always, go to VisuallyStoke.com to check out my stuff. And if you want to support the cause, as always, uh, boom, check me out on my uh, cash app. We, we appreciate any anything you want to provide. Um, and as always, like I said, heat number two is at the printer. Come on and get it. Um, oh, some of the, Anthony, congrats on 50 show. Hope you uh, my, my cousin. Jamari is Jamari is my cousin. Everybody. He's my cousin. My dad, his dad, brothers. Um, that, but that's my cousin. He's fine. He just had some other stuff he needed to take care of. He should be back next week, and we'll celebrate. And thank you, Anthony, for, for the, the congratulations. I appreciate it. So anyway, have a great weekend, everybody. Stop by next week for more creative talk with creative people. This is a Stoke podcast. This is Javon Stokes saying have a great weekend. <laughs>